apologize that we're still in the virtual world. This is a far cry from our uh, former two meetings where I think one we met at the uh, top of the Garlington Lawn and Robinson building and the other at, in the boardroom of the first interstate bank building. But uh, the views uh, on the horizon are not so great here uh, in the virtual world, but uh, all of your smiling faces uh, uh, offsets that. So it's great to have you with us today. We've got a couple of presentations that we would like to share with folks and updates, one being, and I'm going to shift the order of the agenda slightly since Jimmy Grant needs to leave um, a bit early. So we'll start off talking about the Missoula Downtown Heritage Interpretive Plan, and this will be uh, shared with us by Jimmy Grant and Emmy Shear with the uh, City of Missoula. And then we'll talk about our documenting COVID-19 project here in Missoula County. And I think that will be a good segue uh, to then just do a round robin with all of us to both introduce ourselves and talk about what we're each individually uh, and organizationally doing and particularly in light of COVID-19 and and the context that we're all living and breathing. And then we'll wrap up with talking about future meetings of this group and uh, like I mentioned, is there anything specific that uh, we can think of right now that we would like to work on collectively. So with that, uh, Jimmy and Emmy, do you want to in introduce yourselves? And uh, Jimmy, uh, I guess it's probably you if you want to share your screen with us, if you had a, a PowerPoint to share. And it looks like you're muted. There you go. Sure, I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Jimmy Grant. I'm a historian and interpretive planner uh, with Historical Research Associates in downtown Missoula. Um, I've been helping out with the Unseen Missoula program for a couple of years. If those of you not familiar with it, this is a guided tour program that we offer um, through some of the historic structures downtown. We expanded that to offer a riverfront tour program um, and eventually a bicycle tour. We've hosted several exhibitions um, at our Unseen Missoula pop-up museum. And so this is quite a popular offering, um, but it really led us to try to reconsider interpretation in downtown Missoula as a whole. Um, so I'll turn it over to Emmy to have her say a few words about some of the needs for this from the city's perspective. And then I do have a, a, an abbreviated slideshow just going over a few major points of, of why we went why we pursued the interpretive plan, what we hope to accomplish um, with it, and uh, how it can be a great model for our communities. So, Emmy? Yeah, thanks, Jemmy. Um, my name is Emmy Sher. I'm the Historic Preservation Officer for the city. Um, and I also want to do a shout out to Alan Newell, who's also on this uh, meeting, who also is very involved with this plan. Um, so, this all kind of came about from the success of the Unseen tours. And those tours uh, really came about after the, the demolition of the mercantile and the big uh, community conversation that that started, which proved to us uh, with how successful those tours were that the community really wanted more uh, interpretation and more uh, kind of interaction with the heritage of downtown, especially. Um, so we, we got a, we, kind of created this, this subgroup, which we're now calling Heritage Missoula, um, and applied for a grant uh, from the Department of Commerce, which we, um, which we got. And this is a partnership of, of the city and, and other entities and the Missoula Downtown Association, who is primarily housing um, the, the public outreach of, of the plan. So you go to the MDA website to see it. Um, and uh, it just kind of brings everything together, which Jimmy's going to talk about. And um, yeah, it's it's been it's been really exciting. We just got it adopted by the county commissioners last week. Last, last week, I believe. Um, time is flying. So yeah, take it away, Jimmy. And Jimmy, before you get started, uh, just a reminder to folks, if uh, if you have the ability to do so on your end, please mute your lines just so that we can minimize the amount of feedback. Thank you. Jimmy. Okay. So uh, you guys seeing my screen there? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. 
So the, the, the idea for the interpretive plan was essentially to apply a lot of our um, professional practices that we use for museums and heritage districts to the downtown. So really trying to consider downtown Missoula and the historic resources there as kind of a museum without walls, kind of um, a way to view it from a different lens, just focusing primarily on these heritage resources and trying to create a really a cohesive network of messaging as well as um, a physical connection uh, for people to experience these assets. Um, so the plan itself is really just like all other plans, it guides you on how to accomplish uh, these things. So it's a roadmap for communicating our heritage. Um, it's gonna identify some of the stories of downtown Missoula, and it's gonna provide recommendations to how to tell those stories. Um, and again, it's, it's gonna encourage collaboration and connectivity. Now, this was a really important consideration with this particular plan, because unlike a, a state park uh, that we'd be working for, or a national park where there's a superintendent who can simply command that you follow these rules or the direction of a plan and make sure things get done, this is going to just be a collaboration of a lot of different organizations. We're already doing interpretation downtown. Um, folks uh, who own businesses, who are not leaders of nonprofits, who operate museums and the library and, and these types of facilities, this, this provides a way to connect uh, all those individuals. Um, it's going to cover the downtown footprint of the downtown master plan. Now, this was an intentional choice to really kind of limit the overall scope of the project. Obviously, downtown has a lot of heritage resources, so we really wanted to put a focus on this project um, just within this footprint. Obviously, our history expands not only um, just in this tiny little footprint that you see before us, but throughout Missoula County, Western Montana, and nationally as well. So um, we, we tell stories from all those, but just the main focus of where the interpretation is going, where the recommendations are um, lies within this footprint. Um, so it's going to identify themes. Um, you know, interpretation is really about communicating things, in this case, communicating our heritage. And so themes are a way to link things um, through different uh, messages along the way. Um, we're going to include specific recommendations, and it also includes uh, an implementation timeline. And then again, it's going to identify ways to connect existing interpretation and recommendations on new approaches to interpretation. So existing interpretation downtown, here's a photo from our Unseen Missoula tour. Um, that's been a really popular draw and really kind of, you know, gave us the initial idea and, and uh, motivation to pursue interpretive planning. Um, interpretation includes organizations and facilities. Uh, as I mentioned, businesses have heritage resources. Um, some of them offer heritage programs. Uh, we have special events all the time in, in most years in downtown Missoula. Um, we have a lot of programming. Uh, we also have a wayfinding system that has been going in that has a number of layers that we thought, you know, interpretation could allow the wayfinding system to be expanded and uh, we wanted to utilize that asset. Um, digital media exists for downtown. There's been a mobile app for downtown. There's uh, websites that provide messaging. Um, so we have a lot of digital media resources and there's already print. And so the interpret plan is a way to try to find connections for these and way to identify areas to expand them. So as far as the recommendations that, the, that we came up with during the planning process and that ultimately made it into the, the heritage interpretive plan that was recently approved uh, gain support of the city council and county commission um, are identifying in heritage interpretation anchors. And the specific anchors we identified um, are places that already provide some sort of visitor services that already are in the practice of heritage interpretation. And so the anchors identified are the Missoula Public Library, the Missoula Art Museum, the new Zootown Arts Community Center, the ZAC, um, as well as Cares Park. And so these are places where there's already people congregate and this can serve as a launching point um, for such for these activities, um, interpretive activities going forward. Um, we also identified the need to establish heritage interpretation gateways. And this was a recommendation of Donna Gockler from Parks and Rec, who pointed out that a lot of people come into town, um, downtown area on bicycle, walking, whether from the University of Montana, the Bitterroot Bitter Branch Trail, or maybe through Greeno Park coming down from the Rattlesnake. And it's a way to lead them on this heritage interpretation experience um, through kiosks, um, almost like a trailhead entry, but then also allows people to expand out from downtown, already experiencing the heritage resources, um, whether they want to go on a hike up Waterworks Hill or head down the Bitter Branch, um, and they can continue that, that visitor experience that way. 
Um, of course, the wayfinding system is, as I mentioned, it's already in place. So the idea here is to use that to our advantage to identify the heritage assets through a cohesive network on, of wayfinding. And then again, thematically linked um, interpretive media. So every interpretive kiosk, the new ones that we can, they can tie in, connect some of the old old uh, interpretive assets we have, but also um, really create it almost as story points uh, along a larger story of Missoula. As we continue on, uh, you're walking along the Riverfront Trail, you can be linked through interpretive media that, that's connected. One of the main recommendations we came up with, and this is something that we already started now, um, that the Heritage Interpretive Plan has been approved, is to establish what we're calling the Legacy Trail. And the idea is akin to the Freedom Trail in Boston, um, using street medallions to identify some of our um, um, most prominent uh, um, heritage resources, the National Register buildings, um, some of the places where major events occurred, um, and this is in some of the places where there's art exhibitions. And this is going to be a mile and a half long trail, actually a physical trail that you can follow along through downtown Missoula, um, whether you from out of town, you can have friends from out of town, you can bring them along this on a, on a walking trail. Um, I can imagine school groups and field trips will follow this trail along the riverfront, um, maybe up along past the library, and it's going to connect by um, being able to start at each one of those heritage interpretation anchors that I identified. So you can start at any one of those four places um, and be able to pick up a, a brochure that's going to you know, provide interpretive content for that trail. Um, we're hoping to sync it up with some sort of mobile app that will allow people who don't have the brochures to obtain the same content, maybe enhanced content, um, more historical images in front of the buildings, audio narration, um, really the sky's the limit on, on how creative want to pe people really do want to get. But the, the medallions, having something physical on the street um, will signify that you're going on some sort of journey um, in experiencing downtown heritage assets. Uh, of course, we also speak to our cultural, we speak to the cultural and the natural heritage. Um, one way to do that is through the Heritage Tree Program. Uh, this is a, a pro type of program that they have in a number of cities in the Pacific Northwest. I know Seattle has one, uh, Portland, uh, even Spokane has a, a very comprehensive Heritage Tree Program. And the idea is that the city will inventory its own heritage trees, whether it's unique history behind the trees um, or some of the more unique species that are native to this landscape and you can inventory those and provide a, some sort of guidebook um, perhaps interactive map where people can see the various trees also private landowners can can nominate their trees and it's just a way to really draw attention to our urban forest and appreciation for urban forests so again history species um, both public and private creating that registry and then special events um, we can do events such as you know the, the existing run for the trees can tie into the heritage tree program or do special events for arbor day or, or that sort of thing um, most important and, and i think this is the most timely thing um, in our current uh, environment um, given the the headlines that you're reading all around about the need to reassess our view of racism in America, even in Missoula, and really try to articulate that this is a place of many perspectives that people view from many different lenses, and our history is no different. Um, it's important to pull out that this isn't just the downtown of, of Higgins and Warden. This is a downtown of all people who have lived and made an impact on this place and who have experienced this place. So this interpretive plan hopefully does a good job of drawing attention to multiple perspectives and trying to point out the need to interpret history from underrepresented communities and really celebrate our diversity and our shared human experience here um, through programming, special events, um, and of course, partnerships with the many community organizations who are already involved in interpretation. And this should, can include exhibitions and, and lots of other ways, such as public art and murals um, to bring this together. I keep mentioning partnerships and, and we did uh, one example here in this photograph is an example that we did kind of as a pilot project while we were in the interpretive planning process. Now this was a, a exhibit we hosted at River City Roots Festival called This Town is Full of Ghosts. And this was a partnership between Unseen Missoula, uh, as well as the Downtown Foundation, Historical Research Associates and uh, um, Lost Sounds Project of Montana. And when we think of heritage, um, you know, you do oftentimes think about the, the wonderful architecture that we have in downtown Missoula 
of love, but it's again, the human experience here and uh, the punk rock scene in the 1980s and 90s is included in that uh, heritage. So that's what this particular exhibit was um, and really kind of spoke to this music scene and the creativity and the artistic expression that is unique to Missoula. Um, so it's just another way of looking at what makes Missoula, Missoula. And so these type of partnerships are what we hope to encourage throughout um, once more people get on board with what we're trying to accomplish in the interpretive plan. Um, again, University of Montana, the school districts can all be involved. Um, great student project opportunities can come from this, special events, um, exhibitions, and really it comes down to collaboration. So for Unsee Missoula, um, the, the plan recommends having a museum space. Um, we Right now we've been hosting a space in the basement of the Hammond Arcade, and the idea is to make sure that we continue to have a space like that for pop-up exhibitions. Um, that we can rotate in, uh, maybe some of the cultural organizations from throughout the county can have carry some of their collections in and host a, a pop-up exhibition for a month or two um, as part of this process. Um, we just want to make sure we have a space ongoing um, that, that can host such a thing. Um, we'd like to have expanded downtown tours, um, special events as well. And then of course, Heritage Missoula. Um, this is an organizational structure that really came out of the plan, um, but it's, it's meant to encourage collaboration. It's a committee that's um, trying to promote heritage interpretation and help Interp all of the recommendations, the dozens of recommendations that are specific to the plan really come to fruition. So again, this is it's a collaborative process, um, but really I think taking this step back and, and looking at um, Missoula downtown as a place full of rich heritage resources, um, you know, the natural, the cultural, the tangible and the intangible, the stories that we share and know um, are really an important way to communicate our heritage and, and ultimately by communicating it, it's preserving it. So. That is all there. So I'm going to end the show and try to return you to there. <laughs> Good job. Uh, thanks, Jimmy and Emmy. Uh, Alan Newell is is the punk rock scene of uh, the 1980s something you're going to be featured in? I, I'm hoping since you were quite the musician back then, I believe. Who, me? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should talk about the '60s. Okay. okay. Alan right. did. Alan did volunteer at that uh, that pop up exhibit, and he did share some stories of uh, before it was Charlie's, I believe. Oh yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, uh, anyone on the line here uh, have any questions or comments for Jimmy or Emmy or the downtown uh, heritage interpretive plan? Uh, this is Thompson Smith, and uh, I just wanted to thank thank you guys. Thank you, Jimmy, uh, for uh, meeting with the uh, Sadlish Country Spec Culture Committee in San Ignatius, and and uh, welcoming us into um, into the this wonderful partnership. Thank you, Thompson. I, I really appreciate all of the feedback um, and conversations you, you shared with us about this. Um, I think it made the plan a lot stronger, and uh, I really look forward to seeing some of these things come to be. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, you'll have plenty of time if something comes to mind later, uh, feel free to share it with the group, but pretty exciting. I, I think this is a great model, hopefully for elsewhere in the state and will inspire others to do something similar to downtown Missoula. Okay, with that, we will move on to our second item and I'll kick this off and then quickly turn it over to Matt Lotzenheiser with the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. Given the current uh, sort of video conferencing that we are engaged in, it, it's no secret that we are living through unprecedented times with COVID-19. And I think it was about a week after Missoula County officially declared a state of emergency back in March that it occurred to me that we will have missed an opportunity if, if we did not do a good job here in, in our community in Missoula County of, of documenting our experience 
of uh, living through COVID-19 and adapting to it. At that point in time, I was looking around to other historic preservation or cultural uh, organizations, museums, and it was not that there was uh, no talk of COVID-19. There, there was a ton of conversation going on, but it was primarily focused on how do we keep doing what we've always done when we need to shut down for this pandemic. So how do we how do we do our work of interpretation virtually and reach out to our citizens and uh, and folks who would normally frequent our our facilities. But the one thing that seemed to be absent to me was instead of just thinking about how we do what we've always done virtually, what can we do to really play a role in the moment? What do public historians bring to the table given the, the sorts of things that we do, the skills that we bring to the table every single day that might help uh, preserve and record this experience that we're living through? So it was at that point that we started to do some brainstorming internally with Missoula County and look at how we might uh, not only approach this in terms of Missoula County government's response or local government's response, but what is the broader community's response to this, again, unprecedented pandemic? So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Matt. Uh, Matt, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, talk a little bit more about what this project is about and where it might potentially be going in the future. Sure. Uh, thanks, Dave. And for those of you who don't know me, Matt Lotzenizer from the Historical Museum in Fort Missoula. Um, so Dave approached me, I think it was the third week in, in March, and had this idea for doing something that we didn't know of any other community that was undertaking and trying to document kind of in the moment how our community is responding to COVID-19. And it's been an interesting project because I think as historians, we're always more comfortable with dealing with things that happened decades ago than we are things in the moment. Uh, but we've kind of rallied from that. And um, so we started having these initial conversations. And I think um, at first we talked internally just about documenting how the county was doing things. But then we thought, you know, we really should talk about the city and reach out to the university as well. So we can kind of convened our first meeting and Emmy was part of that. Uh, Jimmy was part of it. A number of the other folks, of course, Alan Newell, who's on the line as well, too. And we realized that if we didn't engage the larger community, we'd miss an opportunity, not just to document from a county or a government perspective or a university, but also how everyday Missoulians are uh, coming to grips with this and how their lives are changing and, and adapting to COVID-19. So we met with that first group and uh, what we decided to do was each of us kind of in our own worlds collecting information related to COVID-19. So for example, from my perspective, um, I was able to get on to a number of the phone calls with the emergency operations group and of course Missoula County and a number of other groups, uh, the leadership group between the city and county and we started collecting information. So all the notes from those meetings, um, all the daily um, addresses that were done by the commissioners and by Cindy Farr and Ellen Leahy and all those folks. Uh, so we've just started to gather this information. And the idea is that our end goal is to be able to produce some sort of a report on how our community came together to deal with COVID-19, but also to take all of this great material that we've collected uh, and eventually create a community archive where, whether it be 40 years or 50 years from now or two years from now, uh, that archive would be available not only to the public, uh, to historians, to researchers, but also potentially to our healthcare community so that if they face a similar ordeal in the future, they'll be able to go back and look at how our community responded and the things we did great and the things maybe that we could have done better. Um, so th that was the initial idea behind it. And it's we've now incorporated, we brought in the Missoula Downtown Association and Kalina Wickham, uh, who's done worked with some of our nonprofits downtown. Um, gosh, we brought in uh, Sealy Lake and Swan Valley uh, to try to get some of their perspective and their respective communities. Um, you know, we brought in other folks. Uh, Diane Sands has been joined our group and she's been a great help. 
Uh, but it's it's been really a collective effort just to gather information. And, you know, at this point, we're, we're still, in all honesty, gathering it. And I think that may continue for a period of months yet. So this group's now meeting about every two weeks to talk about where we're at. Um, one of the other really interesting partnerships that's kind of on the that's coming in the next couple months is we're working with the folks at the Missoula County Fairgrounds. They are actually going to do more of a virtual fair this year, and they are actually using a number of the themes related to COVID. Uh, for example, on their craft judging and things like that, people will be making masks, um, and those will be judged as part of a, a competition or a contest. So we're working with them and they're going to preserve some of that information, <clears throat> which should get kind of a grassroots view of how our communities dealt with COVID. Um, in addition to that, um, we worked with the university archives and they've come up with a link where people can go in and they can actually share their stories with the archives. So everyday Missoulians can click on a link and essentially share a short history of how this has impacted them and their daily lives. Same with organizations. Um, some of the other things we've got on tap as we move forward, we're looking at some grant possibilities. Uh, we're, I think we're starting to realize that this is going to be a, a monster of a project to get organized at the end of this. And we, we know that we need to formulate a plan first of how we're going to attack that, but then also um, look at how we're going to go through this archive and organize it so that it can be accessible from researchers and anyone from the community. Um, the other thing we're working on currently, and the university's been doing some excellent work on this, uh, is related to oral histories. Uh, there are already a number of interns that are taking down oral histories from folks that have been involved in the, the COVID-19 response in our community. Everything from, I mean, I've done an interview, my assistant director who also worked at the call center during the whole COVID crisis when it first popped up. She's been interviewed for that process and there's a number of other folks. So I think we're gathering a lot of really great information and we're kind of, you know, we're getting to the point where we're now at a crossroads where we need to look at um, how do we move forward? What are our next steps? And I think that's, that's kind of where we're at as a group right now. Um, Alan, did I miss anything or do you have anything else to add? No, I think I think that about does it, Matt. Um, we are uh, the university has really been a, a great asset to us, as Matt said. And we hope that these oral histories will be able to continue those uh, well into the fall, uh, and particularly if we can get some additional grant funding. What well, the other thing I would say is, um, and we may talk about this a little later, but. Um, it would be great to have all the folks on this call be part of this project as well, too, because all of you have connections in your various communities, um, especially those that are outside of Missoula, because we really do sincerely want this to be a Missoula County project and not a Missoula centered project. Um, even though obviously city county government and the university are here, we definitely want to capture the perspective of some of our outlying communities and some of the other groups in Missoula County. So, yeah. Thanks, Matt. And I think part of the challenge that I've at least experienced is trying to communicate effectively to folks who, when they hear the word history, they either start to drift off into a coma or they, they don't, <laughs> they're thinking uh, decades or centuries ago and are not necessarily thinking about how what they are engaged in right now might be a piece of history. So for instance, I recently was chatting with an executive director of one of our healthcare facilities here in town and and trying to explain or posing the question, what are the questions that you would like answered uh, coming out of COVID-19? So as we're collecting documentation, recording our community experience, what are the specific questions that are burning for you that you'd like to, to know about? And it, it took a while, but I, we, we finally got, um, got to the point where I, we were beginning to, to talk the same language uh, because as this person started to describe the facility at which she works and oversees operations, it was clear that they have been doing just some extremely creative work in terms of on the fly uh, 
troubleshooting and figuring out a path forward to respond to this experience. And that is a piece of history that we are living, although this individual may not have seen it as such to begin with. So that's that's part of our challenge, I think, is recognizing and being able to communicate to folks what it is that we're doing and uh, and why it's important. Uh, I see folks uh, representing various organizations on the line here and including some federal agencies such as the U.S. Forest Service or state of Montana. And similarly, I can bet you that that uh, the folks from these agencies on the line today, uh, six months ago, probably were not thinking you were going to be in the midst of a pandemic and how do you continue on with your natural resource management work or cultural resource management work under these circumstances. So those two are the sorts of stories that I think we're wanting to tease out and document uh, and better understand. Questions, folks, and uh, like I say, uh, the next part of this meeting that I hope to roll into is just some round robin where we can each share what we've been up to, maybe how we've been responding to the work that we do uh, in the midst of this pandemic. And uh, you could also avail yourselves of that opportunity to describe uh, or maybe pose some additional questions about how you might want to be a part of, of this project. Uh, Matt, do you have any specific thoughts if, if folks would like to engage in in this documentation project what they could do so i if anybody is interested um i think everybody should have my email if you don't i can always put it in the chat uh, box but um by all means if you're interested in being involved reach out to me and i'm happy to get you onto that call that we do every two weeks so you can kind of see how the calls and the type of things we're collecting uh, there's also a number of uh, like google docs and things like that that we have that list what each group is connecting or collecting so that you can get a better perspective on what potentially you could collect within your organization or your community. So I'm happy to do that if anybody's interested. I, like I said, I'll add my email to the chat box um, in case anybody doesn't have it. But um, yeah, I guess, you know, it's interesting. I don't know about you guys and, you know, as a historian, when this first happened in March, one of the first things I did was to go back and read the article that Ellen Leahy did about the 1918 flu. Um, and I kind of, you know, as we look at things and we think about things in that sense, um, what we're trying to do is create something so that people 100 years from now or 50 years from now are going to have all the resources they need to properly study this important historical moment that we're all going through right now. So, um, yeah, it, like I said, it's, you know, if, if it's kind of that as historians looking back on the past, if we, what would we want access to if we were studying a period of past of the past? And that's kind of what we're trying to preserve here. Uh, one of the more interesting things I found with the archive is unlike what we typically do as historians where you're reading the after the incident reports, we're actually, because we're collecting this in the moment, it's really fascinating to watch the the whole thing kind of evolve and change and see decisions that are being made at the city and county level from the very first discussion through the resolution that they eventually come to um so that's been really fascinating and i think again that's going to be something that is going to be uh, great food for historians and in, in generations to come so i'm really pleased that dave thought of this idea and, and got me involved in it and that uh, all the other folks that have been involved as well, too. Thanks, Matt. And yeah, if you wanted to put your email address in the chat box, but also I think what we'll do is we can send out a follow up to this meeting to the distribution list of everyone who participated and include in there a link to how you can contribute uh, stories to this project, information to this project, uh, and also uh, we'll I include again points of contact if you want to become more uh, intimately engaged in what's going on here. Uh, initial questions, thoughts for Matt while he is still on the line here. Uh, Dave and Matt, uh, this is Thompson Smith. And, uh, hi, Thompson. Wonderful. Uh, hi. Uh, wonderful uh, project. Uh, just a quick question Have you? Um, engage the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes in this? 
So that's a great question, Thompson. We've actually been working through Diane Sands, and I believe she's reached out to the cultural committee. But um, if you would be interested in, in being part of the project, I think we would absolutely love to have you. Thompson well, has, has a lot to do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thompson but, uh, has, has yeah. Diane mentioned, uh, has Diane reached out to you that you know of? Uh, not that I know of. It's possible okay. she emailed Tony. Um, okay. I, I, I may not be aware of that. Um, I, I would just uh, note that um, many of the conversations I've had with tribal members uh, since this, this uh, pandemic really uh, kind of unfolded have have had a, a very strong um, historical reference point, as you can imagine, with the experience of tribal people with pandemics. And many of them have have felt an almost PTSD-like experience emotionally uh, in engaging with this, as all the stories that have come down from uh, the elders about smallpox and other uh, epidemics in the, in the past, and not that distant the past either um they, they've just come kind of flooding back and um but also the, there's a very um dynamic and interesting tribal response occurring um they established something called the unified uh command uh dealing with the epidemic and actually just had four days of mass testing events uh at our Lee, Pablo, Polson, and Elmo uh, over this past week. So um, uh, I don't know if anyone was videoing those things, uh, but they were they were pretty amazing. And um, I would also just uh, mention that Ellen uh, Leahy also did a wonderful article about the last uh, documented smallpox epidemic in Montana. The epidemic of 1901 and um, she generously shared a lot of her uh, information with me and we've been kind of gradually working on a history of of the uh, Salish and Kalispell people uh, and uh, smallpox so, and non-native diseases more broadly but um, I would just encourage you um, to reach out directly um, to some of the tribal folks Thanks, Thompson. Anyone else right now with a comment or question? Well, let's just dive right into our uh, kind of uh, round table, uh, round robin discussion. And if you have anything that you'd like to bring up relative to either the Missoula Downtown Interpretive Plan or a COVID-19 uh, documentation project, please feel free. And so what I'm going to do, and this might be in slightly different order on other folks' computer screens, but I'm just going to go down my list of participants. If folks want to introduce themselves, who they are, who they're affiliated with, and if there's anything uh, particular, particular that you'd like to share about the work that you're doing uh, to share with the group, uh, Please do. And it looks like uh, Alan Newell, uh, you are at the top of my list. Uh, anything else you want to add? No, just for folks who don't know, I'm, I'm uh, on the uh, Missoula Downtown Foundation. So the foundation's been very involved in, of course, both of these projects since the, since the start. So um, I think I've added what I can to that. But if anybody has questions about it, we're really trying to work with the downtown businesses and the communities uh nonprofits in the downtown as well to try and document their response uh, so great thanks uh chet krauser you're muted chet yeah. there we go dave had to turn on my video and my audio um so we it seems like we've had a number of different uh topics that have fallen into the heritage category here over the past several months um, not so much directly involved but kind of on the periphery um, certainly have uh, worked in some of the earlier conversations with dave and matt about how to try to document uh, some of what's going on surrounding all of the covid um, changes and and just dealing with the virus and, and what it means for our communities 
And and Chad, who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Chad Krauser with the uh, Community and Planning Services with Missoula County. I always make the assumption that I'm known and nobody knows me. So I thank you, Dave, for helping me on that. <laughs> um, so yeah, Community and Planning Services. And so uh, we have we have most of the planning um, function for the county, but we also have parks, trails, and open lands. Um, and we have sustainability. And then uh, we tend to get a lot of other community interest topics and kind of special projects and things that um, if they don't fall squarely with other folks, they, they maybe migrate here and, and we have a lot of enthusiasm in picking those up. Um, so in addition to working on, on the COVID-19 documentation front, um, we've also just had a lot of other things that have been coming forward, like the support uh, for the downtown heritage interpretive plan um, and working with the commissioners to get that to um, to Emmy and to Jimmy. So that was good. And um, just another opportunity to have those conversations about what's going on heritage wise within the community. And that prompted some interest uh, in that discussion about how we might use that ever to connect to our more rural communities and through some of the community councils to um, hear what some of their stories might be, or at least to prompt a discussion about how they relate to some of the heritage values and, and um, conversations going on in their community. So um, so stay tuned on that front. We'll see what, what sorts of things come up there. Um, we also had a, a register for or a national historic register nomination uh, that the county commissioners were uh, asked for for an opportunity to provide input. So we did that. That was the Stark House nomination up in the Condon area. So that was kind of fun just to start to talk a little bit about that. Um, and it was just a quick exposure, but I think again, another example of uh, heritage discussions and properties that exist out there in the county. And we're starting to pay a little bit closer attention to some of those things. Uh, we also have been talking about Lalonde um, here, not so much during the COVID timeframe, we were at a little bit of a hiatus and had to postpone a couple of meetings, but moving forward, with a smaller steering committee. Uh, we had done some initial focus group meetings uh, earlier on. Gosh, Dave, that seems like forever ago now. It was probably, it probably was several months ago that we did some focus group meetings to just get some input on um, what folks thought of a framework that the, the smaller group had established in terms of trying to identify some of the heritage resources out at the Lalonde Ranch uh, here in Missoula. And um, we'll probably have that wrapped up at this point, both the summary of those uh, of the input that we received as well as the a framework to give us some potential guiding direction there and and, and a direction that's aimed really at committing to the historic and, and uh, heritage resources on the site as opposed to maybe exploring other options there that could would uh, potentially threaten those resources so that's been another topic that we've had in conversation and uh, and then just continuing to to talk a little bit about what the the county might consider as far as being more engaged in heritage resource management uh, overall, and again trying to identify those opportunities that exist out there. I was able to steal about an hour of Emmy's time to visit with her a little bit about the work that she does and uh, the role that she plays for the city and things she's observed in the county more broadly. Uh, just to try to kick around the idea of of uh, you know if Missoula County was to look at that and, and try to have a bit more of a programmatic level of involvement what that what might that look like so lots of kind of bigger picture topics really and and things that are um, probably just involved a little bit i'll call it dipping my toe into a little bit more of what's going on countywide but um i really appreciate uh, the heritage community generally and i uh, have had a bit of a past exposure with state parks on that front so i always just kind of enjoy it just for myself anyway and have it a near and dear sort of topic so that's uh, in a nutshell kind of what I've been up to. Thanks, Chad. And I, I would just I'll just expand on a couple of things uh, since we're talking about Missoula County heritage initiative. So Chet mentioned the historical Lond Ranch, which for those folks who don't know where that is, it's out uh, by Airport Boulevard, uh, uh, kind of across uh, the street from from Big Sky Brewing and uh, and it's that old cool looking historic farmstead that you've probably driven by a million times and may or may not know that that actually is uh, owned by Missoula County and and arguably has uh, one of if not the oldest standing structures in its original location in Missoula County, an old log cabin. So. Uh, uh, we will be, or I will be, sometime later in the month of July, bringing forward a resolution to the commission that would firmly establish Missoula County as preserving this site for its historic and uh, 
and uh, heritage qualities. It would adopt the strategic framework that Chet alluded to. It would put Missoula County on record as supporting a National Register of Historic Places nomination for the site, and it would place uh, coordination for stewardship activities at the site within the wheelhouse of community and planning services. A couple other quick things. We've already talked about the COVID-19 documentation project. Missoula County, along with the city of Missoula, are looking at uh, trying to acquire the federal building, the historic federal building in downtown Missoula, which has sat nearly vacant for uh, a number of years since the Forest Service relocated its assets out to Fort Missoula. And so that would certainly have a uh, uh, an impact on stewarding yet another historic property in downtown Missoula and, and uh, allow for both the city and county to play a role in that. And finally, I just mentioned that I have been exploring the possibility and what it would take to uh, as part of the bridge reconstruction project on the Higgins Avenue bridge, rededicate the bridge and rename it uh, for uh, uh, a name for which uh, the uh, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes or the Salish and Kalispell Culture Committee would uh, uh, put forward a name that would be more appropriate than yet another old dead white guy uh, that uh, uh, pretty much uh, we have a plentitude of such names throughout our uh, city for infrastructure. So that's ongoing and uh, I've had conversations with Thompson who's on the line and others and I'm optimistic that we'll uh, find a path forward for that. Emmy Shear, do you want to say anything else? Uh, yeah, so again, Emmy Shear with uh, City of Historic Preservation. I've been working on the COVID documentation um, that Matt was talking about, as well as the heritage plan that Jimmy was talking about, as well as uh, working with Chet and Dave and everyone else on the Lalonde and the federal building procurement. Um, in addition to that, uh, usually May is Historic Preservation Month, but due to COVID, we didn't get to celebrate in our normal way. The Historic Preservation Commission didn't this year. But we did uh, still send out awards um, in the mail. So this year we had preservation awards and the county was actually the recipient of two of those for commercial restoration of the fairgrounds, commercial or culinary building um, and the uh, commercial building and then the uh, courthouse and all of the restoration that's been going on there over the many years. And another recipient was uh, the Forest Service for Building 26 at Fort Missoula, and then just a private residential um, uh, restoration. And then we also awarded uh, three legacy businesses for the legacy business uh, recognition, which is our second year doing that. So it's for businesses that have been in Missoula um, over 100 years. We did make one exception this year. Um, and so we awarded Warden's Market, Benson's Farm, and uh, Mountain Press Publishing, which has actually only been here 50 years, but they're very active in the community and they had a great nomination. So we wanted to, to go ahead and give them an award. Um, so we did go ahead and do that, although no physical party or tours this year, um, but we'll be recognizing them next year for our, for our actual ceremony. And then as far as historic preservation in the city, I'm working on putting together, um, I'm calling it a preservation objectives portfolio. And I'm going through our existing code and incentives and basically just um, doing research on what needs to be improved upon for city regs and our incentive programs, um, local register, getting that working, adaptive reuse all the things that other cities are doing um, that we could we could also do here in Missoula. And I'm working with three city council members on that as well. So um, that's kind of my, my big thing that I've been working on while COVID has been happening, um, as well as many other things, the demolition of the Rattlesnake Dam, that was actually seen to be negative effect by SHPO um, section 106. So we're doing all the mitigation for that. Um, and 
still working on our new adaptive reuse ordinance, which went through and we have three new applicants, which is really exciting. So um, they get to utilize this new incentive that we, we put through um, and hopefully we'll get that overlay on these properties here soon, so. Thanks, Emmy. Uh, Lauren, are you out there? Lauren Flynn. Hey, Dave. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, we're done. Tell it or uh, uh, trying to do two things at once here, and I'm never very good at that. Um, so COVID, in, in, sorry, I guess I'll introduce myself. I'm Lauren Flynn. I'm the regional manager for Montana State Parks. Um, COVID's kind of thrown an interesting wrinkle into state parks um, with the uh, being declared an essential service. And of course, all of us, I think, we're looking for ways to get outdoors a little bit more. And so our park visitation uh, starting about the middle of March has been astronomical. Um, and that's been at both recreation sites and cultural sites. So we've been, especially the cultural sites, have had an interesting dynamic of people coming to places like Traveler's Rest or Council Grove, looking for ways to get outside and not understanding uh, the cultural significance of those of those sites. So our staff, while trying to practice social distancing and and uh, and and good methods, have also been uh, also busy interpreting those sites and trying to instill some stewardship in the folks that were there to walk their dog or go for a run or things like that. Uh, something we always face, but even more so, it seems like, um, over the last two or three months. Um, specific projects we're working on, continuing to move forward slowly with um, uh, a, a redesign or a new site concept anyway for Council Grove State Park. Um, have met with, with Thompson and Tony and others up there uh, pre-COVID and are hoping and we're able to get back into that swing. Um, We've had a, our landscape architect out to kind of do a get us a rough site concept on that that we'll be sharing. I'm hoping, Dave, with the commissioners here uh, at some point, as we've discussed in the past, um, looking at some of the challenges we have there. Um, also continuing to move forward to some some uh, uh, cultural stuff out at, at Milltown State Park. Um, we're, we're engaging with a uh, um, a uh, design consultant again to maybe come up with a, a concept for a ranger station out there long into the future, I'm sure. Um, and now we are continuing to work, move forward at Traveler's Rest. The visitor center has been opened up about two weeks now. Um, seeing a fairly steady visitation uh, out there at the visitor center. Um, had to take a lot of, of uh, COVID measures into place before we could reopen that. So working with our nonprofit partner out there to develop, uh, you know, it goes against my grain, but we we took away all the touch table stuff and put it under glass, and that goes against my interpreter's grain. But you know, uh, desperate times call for desperate measures, I guess. Uh, so we've been scrambling a little bit down there just to make sure that we were following the right protocols and trying to keep visitors safe. Um, I think that'll do it for our end. Great. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Lauren. So we've got a Greg or Gregory on the line. Hi, how are you doing? Good, I'm welcome. Greg, I'm Greg Gustina and I'm with the Forest Service. I'm what's called a staff officer. So I work for Carolyn Upton. She's the forest supervisor. She couldn't make it today, so I'm sitting in for her. Um, but appreciate the conversation, of course. The Forest Service has a number of different projects, especially at many of our, our ranger stations and on the fort. I was glad to hear. I didn't know or I hadn't heard about the Building 26 award, and that's great to hear. I work in Building 24, which is a, didn't get the nice historic update. But um, <laughs> anyways, it's still great to be out at the historic fort. And I know we've done some interpretation out there, helped with that. Um, but I don't have a whole lot to add to the conversation because um, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to prepare today for background, but I do appreciate um, some of the ideas. I think um, the plan for Missoula County, I like the downtown plan. I think that that could also dovetail fairly nicely, fairly nicely with adjacent counties um, in terms of 
you know, I'm thinking mineral. I know that they were trying to put some things together there. Um, obviously, that would be bigger and beyond probably what you want to get into. And then on COVID, I agree. We had, it's been really interesting, the switch from dealing with COVID. Um, things have changed so fast. We've seen a lot of that. So I, I really think that's a great idea to capture some of that, capture some of the feelings that people have. Um, anyways, that's it for me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And please uh, convey our uh, best wishes to Carolyn. And uh, and also, if there are opportunities for uh, greater heightened collaboration between the Forest Service, the Lolo National Forest, and, and Missoula, Missoula County on heritage uh, effort, please, please let us know. Will do. Thank you. Uh, Jim, uh, McDonald, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Emmy and Matt, of course, have um, talked about some of the things that we've been involved in, so I won't uh, do that. I just want to say that the Montana Preservation Alliance is also re asking different communities across the state to uh, put together their thoughts on COVID-19 and try and get a broad perspective across the state of Montana. And uh, so there's been some of that being done and I'm sure there'll be contact in Missoula here too to just see you know how this all can tie in together. But it's uh, pretty important that we uh, look at that. The other thing, and I, I guess I can announce now because it was on, on uh, the uh, news the other night, but um, the National Trust has the uh, African American Culture Heritage Action Fund uh, that they uh, that they uh, uh, put out every year, and I think there were 540 uh, applications this year. And um, the uh, State Historic Preservation Office um, in Helena was one of the final 53. Uh, and I think because it, they announced it that they might have gotten one of the one of the uh, grants. And it this is something that's gone, been going on for years and has is of course becoming part of what's happening now with uh, um, uh, Black Lives Matters, but it's also something that's been part of the National Trust for a long time. So I just wanted to mention that and see if that has moved ahead. I'm not quite sure. I was trying to get a hold of Kate Hampton, who's uh, doing the work on it, and I wasn't able to this morning to talk to her to if they got the final grant. But uh, uh, just talking about the, the um, African Americans in Montana, the businesses, some of the leaders, some of the people that were involved uh, in uh, the history of Montana and uh, get that uh, known out here. So just wanted to mention that. Aaron, that uh, everything else has pretty much been said. So thanks. Thanks, Jim. And that's Jim McDonald with Annie Architects. And you're on the Historic Preservation Commission. And what else, Jim? Oh, thanks for taking. <laughs> I'm also a trustee on the museum uh, board. OK. Are you listed uh, on the National Register yet, Jim? Uh, not yet. OK, <laughs> we can work on that. <laughs> OK, Judy Matson. Hi, um, I'm with the Bonner Milltown History Center and Museum. And um, unfortunately, uh, because we can't meet the guidelines, for one thing, we're all uh, all historic artifacts ourselves who work out there, except for one person, Kim Brigaman. Um, we are closed indefinitely until we can meet the guidelines. We're a very hands-on um, institution and in a very small space with high-risk people. So it's not working out the way we had hoped. We were had hoped and planned to have it extended hours for the summer. Instead, we're um, totally online for our offering. One thing that has happened that was good was that normally we um, host the first grade class at Bonner School, Kristen Vogel's class, and uh, they come and learn how to dial telephones and see how a ringer washer machine works. That didn't happen this year, so we um, produced a walking tour, which was used by the entire school with um, historic sites for a walk around Bonner, something we've been intending to do someday. And because of the pandemic, someday um, came, which is going to open up possibilities, I think, for the teachers to reach out for certain parts of that walking tour that are particular interest to a lesson or a unit they're doing in the future. So we hope to become more involved with the school through that. And uh, we're also just continuing to uh, 
catalog our oral histories and our videos at this point. So I think Miney Smith's on the line. She may have some more things to add. Yeah, let's let's go to Minnie. Do you have anything else you want to jump in there with? And it uh, looks like you're muted, Minnie. So uh, if you could unmute and go ahead and introduce yourself for the folks. Uh, I'm Miney Smith, and um, I work with Judy at the History Center. But as she said, it's not been open. Uh, I've been in England uh, since this all began. So I just got back maybe a week, a little over a week ago. So I haven't caught up with a lot that's been going on. So this is all very instructive to me. It's very exciting, I think, to hear all the things that are happening, positive things that are happening. Um, anyway, uh, uh, no, I don't have anything more to add about the, what the History Center is doing or not doing. Um, but we are, uh, we had an intern um, before all this happened who was uh, putting all our, all our di digitizing all our information. And she's been able to complete that. Isn't that right, Judy? Yeah. She, she, she's been able to complete uh, the work in progress. Huh? The work is still in progress. Progress. Okay. okay. Anyway, it's in progress. Okay. That no, I don't have anything more to say. But it was it was interesting being in England and um, their lockdown was I think maybe more stringent than here in the States. So uh, that was interesting too. Well, welcome back. Glad well, you're uh, thank you back home safe and well. Thank you, Miney. Uh, Kim Brigaman, are you out there and anything you want to add? Check your muted, Kim. Oh, there we go. There we yeah, go. I am out. <clears throat> I am out here and just uh, I I'm trying to keep up with all of this in the role of, I guess, as a Missoulian reporter, but also um, with Judy and Miney at the Bonner Milltown History Center. Um, we had at, at at the History Center. We were working with uh, Fort Missoula on, um, I guess, fundraising for locomotive number seven and uh we had some exciting i thought exciting projects lined up um that have so far gone by the wayside i guess um and in terms of what i'm hearing um i'm intrigued by some of the things that thompson smith has brought up in terms of the tribes and uh, also what dave told me Kind of, he took the time to recount um, from last meeting what the tribal, the cultural committee brought to this meeting, um, and uh, I, I, I'm interested, I guess, in getting some of that information to the public through the newspaper. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Uh, Matt. Matt, are you out there still? Would you like to add anything else that you didn't hit on earlier? Sure. Um, so we've actually been incredibly busy uh, in the midst of all this. I think um, there was part of me that thought, oh, this is going to be kind of a quiet time to get some back burner projects done. And it, it really hasn't been. Um, between the, the COVID project and a number of other things here at the museum, we've been we've been hopping. Um, First and foremost, we are open. Uh, we opened the museum to the public again on June 1st. Uh, we worked with the county health department to come up to what we felt would be a safe environment for our visitors, our staff, and our volunteers. So we've, you know, the county's been wonderful with helping us with hand sanitizer units, with a plexi shield at the front desk, uh, plenty of masks that we can give to our visitors. Um, so that's been a real positive, and we saw. I think last I counted in the first 10 days or so we were open, we've seen about 250 people come through the museum. So it's it's been good to see. It feels great to be open again. We're all still a little nervous about it, as I'm sure all of you are as well, too. Uh, but but it's good to be back providing that service to our community and to visitors to our community. 
The two big projects I'd like to mention, um, and I think Kim hinted a little bit about our locomotive project. So we started working on this. Um, it was kind of interesting. I think we all know how occasionally somebody just essentially falls into your lap uh, that makes a huge difference in our organizations. And we had a gentleman by the name of Larry Ingold uh, who had retired from the railroad industry out in California and bought a house down in Hamilton. And he approached us about two years ago now about our locomotive. And Larry had worked on several pretty major locomotive restoration projects. And so we started working with him a little bit and we formulated a plan to take care of number seven and, and get it back up to the way it should look. And as part of that plan, the first phase was to build a pull barn over the locomotive. And then the second phase will be a, a full cosmetic and a partial mechanical restoration of the locomotive. And we've raised the money for the pull barn and we got a lot of great work done last week on it. So that project, the first phase should be done within the next month, I'd think, which is really exciting for us. Um, we've also had some good luck with fundraising on the actual restoration of it. Uh, we were able to raise about $30,000 for the pull barn and we continue to bring that budget down. Uh, so any money that doesn't get spent on the pull barn will be rolled into the actual ro locomotive restoration. Uh, in addition to that, as part of the Missoula Gives campaign this year, we raised another 14,000 for that. So we're probably sitting at about 20,000 towards the restoration of the locomotive. and. We still have a ways to go. We're looking at probably about 90,000 total for that project, but it's coming along uh, pretty quickly and it's been great to see and the community response to that as well too. So that's the locomotive project. Uh, the other thing we're working on right now, and we hope to get the first phase of this project done by the end of the summer, early fall, is um, an assessment of the two original alien detention center barracks that we've moved back to Fort Missoula in the last two years. Uh, one of them was on the DNRC campus uh, and they were looking to build a new maintenance shed and it sat in that spot. So we worked with them to bring the building and move it back to Fort Missoula and put on a foundation. We then constructed a second foundation and worked with Missoula County to disassemble building 18 at the fairgrounds, uh, which will be reassembled eventually on that foundation that we've constructed. But the exciting news was um, we worked with the county grants department and we applied for a Japanese American confinement sites grant in the fall. And we actually received a $40,000 grant towards the assessment of those two original barracks. And these are the full proper historic assessment of both buildings, as well as all the planning that we need to do for those buildings uh, to essentially be after the assessment and planning is done, we'll be shovel ready to start raising funds to restore both the buildings. Uh, completely. So that's really exciting. Um, and our friends group just recently met and they voted to match with some of their reserves the $40,000 grant. So that project, the assessment phase of that project is now fully funded. So we're in that, we're in the RFQ process, which should end here around July 2nd, and then we'll get to pick somebody to to work with and, and kind of go from there. So that's really exciting uh, to be part of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and not to brag about the museum a little bit, but we did uh, receive an award from the AASLH, an award of excellence for our exhibit in our Heath Gallery, which was um, the uh, No Enemy Movement Observed. It was about a French town Marine, and it focused on one man's experiences in Vietnam in 1966 when he was drafted and spent 13 months as part of the Marines. And it's, it's not your typical war exhibit. It's definitely much more of a personal look at his journey from as he refers to himself as a basic, basically qualified Marine and the impact that that service for 13 months has had on his life uh, continuing on. And we were able to open a lot of discussions about things like PTSD and those. So we were really proud of that exhibit and it was wonderful to be recognized by ASLH on that one as well. So as you can see, things are kind of chugging along. So yeah, that's, thanks Dave. Yeah, thank you. That's a lot of good stuff. Uh, Catherine, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what you have going on? Sure. Uh, this is my school account. So I actually, I go by Casey. I'm Casey Dizerns Morgan. Um, and I am a not so new anymore co-president of Preserve Historic Missoula. Um, so this is my first, um, one of these round tables. Um, and so it's nice to e-meet you all. Um, 
Let's see, I am getting my PhD in anthropology and historic preservation from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and so I work in Mexico, but i um, live in um, Missoula now. Um, and my husband who works with Jim at A&E is the other co-president, his name is Matt Morgan. Um, and so uh, we had a lot of plans for sort of ramping up our advocacy and, and, and really trying to get um, things going again with Preserve Historic Missoula. Um, but COVID sort of put a damper on a lot of our plans. Unfortunately, um, we can't, you know, couldn't do many in-person things and most of the preservation month activities um, didn't happen. Um, so right now um, we're sort of reassessing, hoping things will open back up so that we can do some more um, public lectures and education. We're really trying to um, beef up that side of um, uh, of what we do um, and also do advocacy. So it's nice to meet all of you. And um, if there's anything, um, you know, we've been working pretty closely with Emmy in trying to see where we can help out with the more the advocacy side. Um, we were going to do a um, endangered list again, um, but we did not do that because we thought people didn't need more bad news uh, in the time of COVID. So um, we did start um, nominations for favorite historic properties but um, it didn't really take off. I think people had a lot on their minds. So we may revisit that in the fall and try to try to do that again and, and sort of highlight some of the great historic resources around town that people um, you know, may not know about, may not know the history of. Um, and so keep that going. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, looking to do some more events. We had been doing some events with Imagination Brewing, um, and, and getting um, some public lectures there. Uh, we did a, a growler uh, carrier build night there um, back in February, I guess now. Um, and so we'll do, try to do that again once things are, are open. Um, but um, our, I'll put our email address um, in the chat and we're open to sort of any collaboration and any advocacy things. Um, we're just trying to get that started up again. Yeah, thank you. And if things go as planned with any luck, uh, we will help you take one of your most endangered sites off your list uh, by way of the Lalonde Ranch. So uh, that will hopefully be a success story. Uh, Paul Filicetti. Sure, thank you very much. Um, my name is Paul Filicetti. I'm an historic preservation architect with A&E Architects. Um, and, uh, I'm also a member of the Historic Preservation Commission. I'm on the board at the Missoula Art Museum and I'm on the City Cemetery Board. I'll just talk briefly about some of the things that are going on. Aside from things that Emmy mentioned with the HPC, HPC is also looking at a Missoula Historic Preservation Plan or updating our plan. Um, it's probably a long range project, but it is something that's in the works and kind of out there. Uh, Emmy mentioned the awards project. I mean, uh, architect who's working on those fairgrounds projects and and commercial culinary building and submitted those awards, as well as a courthouse project that one is just wrap, just wrapping up. Hopefully within the next six months or so, we'll have the new copper doors on the building and we can finish that up. Um, kind of celebrate the end of that project. Um, in terms of MAM Zool Art Museum certainly in terms of what they're doing and looking at the federal building across the street from them as a potential place to for uh, growth for the art museum. That's something the board talks about a lot. In terms of what's going on at the city cemetery, um, there was a discussion of COVID-19 and the impacts in terms of internments out of the cemetery at the last board meeting for what it's worth, but as well, the, the cemetery is going through a strategic planning process and we hired a consultant out of New York to work with us on and they developed a strategic plan. And uh, we did a board review of that and sent it back to those comments back to the the group for uh, kind of a draft to update their draft comments. So we're expecting that to come back in the next month or so. But that'll be eventually going out to the public. One of the components of the plan that the board opposed that was in the in their recommendations was to remove some of the roads out of the historic portion of the city cemetery or to develop as you can imagine develop additional grave sites because that's the more favored part of the, the cemetery so 
board was opposed to that idea and uh, I think it was made pretty clear hopefully to that consultant that I'd like to take that out of the process. There was also kind of a push from city council to talk about using or integrating parks, uh, city parks to, into the, the city cemetery and wasn't sure where that was coming from or what was going on there, but um, certainly something that the board is gonna be looking at in the future, probably the city council as well. So just some things there, thank you. Thanks, Paul. So this is where uh, uh, having a, a, a first name that is uh, towards the end of the alphabet uh, comes into play. So uh, some of you got the short end of the stick in terms of having to wait so long. Uh, so finally, Sharon, what would you like to share? Uh, I'm on the board of the Upper Swan Valley Historical Society, and I just had a couple of things. One is that uh, we were taking the lead, especially Steve Lamar, our president, in the getting the designation for the Stark House. And we really appreciate everybody's support in that effort because it turns out that we're just, you know, an inch away from getting the final designation and we're thrilled. Um, with reg we're also involved in the documenting the COVID project. And there will be an article in the Pathfinder this next week that ties this year's experience to the 1918 experience in the Valley. And we've put a pitch in there for the documenting project as well. And we are opening up on the 3rd of July. So we're deep in the throes of the protocols for what we have to do to make that safe for our guests. And that's about it from us. All right. Always great to hear from our friends in the swan. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Thompson, it looks like we finally got a video feed of you. And it looks like you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, we got you. All right. Uh, yeah, I finally got this thing to work on my phone. Uh, not on the computer. Uh, so, um, we're we're working on a lot of things as usual um uh you know and and with the uh with the rising voices about the issues of injustice and racism and um and violence um that just in a way just gives added impetus to what we've been doing for a while and what we've been doing in partnership with with missoula county and and with the folks in the swan uh and, and other other places for a while. So uh, uh, as Matt said, uh, I, I feel like uh, I've been crazy busy too, uh, even though the tribes have been shut down. I've been, I've been working um, more hours <laughs> rather, than, rather than fewer hours. Um, you know, it's great to be involved in the Missoula plan. Uh, as far as um, kind of concrete things we have in the works, um, we're working with Trout Unlimited and other folks uh, on interpretation at the Rattlesnake Dam site. Uh, we have, uh, we've put forward um, an idea for a couple signs there. One that'll basically be kind of a refocused uh, version of the sign we have for the Missoula Valley that's up in the courthouse. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the uh, Sophie Moise room and also at uh, Fort Missoula Regional Park. So this you know, that sign uh, kind of gets a little bit refined with each iteration. So uh, there'll be a version of that. And then there'll also be a sign about the place name for Rattlesnake Creek itself, uh, which translates to a uh, place of the little bull trout in uh, Flystum, which is the short version of that is, is used by uh, Salish speakers for the city of Missoula as a whole now uh, and has been since the city was established. So, um, and kind of connected to that, we have a couple signs uh, that we're gonna be working on with the Grant Creek uh, interpretive folks. Um, and we've just exchanged some good emails with them. Um, and one of them will also be uh, an adjusted version of our Missoula Valley sign, uh, part of the ethnogeographic sign series. And Kim, uh, if, uh, if Tony uh, gives the go ahead and, and maybe uh, does an interview with you you know, we that would be great to, to have a little story about the, uh, the ethnogeography project and the signs initiative that's tied to it. Uh, but the other sign we're going to have at Grant Creek is about 
um, a little known history uh, that we have really researched uh, pretty thoroughly over the last few years about the origins of the English place named Missoula, uh, which comes from the uh, ancient name for the middle Clark Fork River in Massoudla. So it was kind of anglicized and shortened. And the source of that name was the wife of Christopher Higgins, who was a Kalispell woman and a speaker of the Kalispell language, uh, Julia. And uh, uh, so when Higgins and Warden picked up the Hellgate training post and moved it to the confluence of Rattlesnake Creek and the Clark Fork River in 1865, She's the one who suggested this name uh, to her husband. And so they initially called that establishment Missoula Mills and shortly thereafter shortened it. So uh, we'll have a sign about that. Um, the other thing is that we've, um, we've got our fingers crossed, but it looks like we have a decent shot at some funding that'll fund a number of elements of this ethnogeography project, the, the project about the documentation of place names. Uh, so it looks like it'll fund um, the development of an app website that'll work seamlessly with all these things and provide visitors with an almost unlimited quantity of interactive information, maps, historic documents, photographs, and mo perhaps most impo importantly, audio and video uh, since uh, we, we well realize that most of those uh, Salish names, uh, people have no idea how to correctly pronounce. Uh, so um, that's one of the things will be funded. And the other thing uh, we're hoping will get funded out of that is um, a subvention for the publication of our atlas, the overall um, volume one of, of the Salish Kalispell Atlas. So, um, these things will will connect with all these interpretive projects we have going on. Um, I'll leave the other things aside. Uh, we're Lauren. Uh, good to hear your voice out there. It was before I had video, but uh, connection here. But um, uh, we look forward to working with you and Mike Studia uh, about the things we are already in conversation about. So thanks thanks to you all, and and it's just good to. Good to see folks' faces and, and be a part of the conversation. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I have a number here on the line that I'm not familiar with, 239-7738. Uh, hello, Tim Jones here. I'm sorry, who is that? Hello, Tate Jones here. Tate Jones. Oh, Tate. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Tate. Uh, tell us what's going on out at uh, How are you doing? At the Ford in your neck of the woods. Oh, very good. Thank you. Executive Director of Rocky Mountain Museum of Military History and President Northern Rockies Heritage Center, both in Fort Missoula. And we are open and operating. Um, we are going to be our going to have the presence at the by four, regardless, we won't have a big celebration going on. We will have the Sons of America 18th Army demonstrations and disperse on our front lawn. 14th Center are going to have a first out program um, of centers from the University of Idaho on the Civilian Conservation Corps. So I'm caveating all this. I think there's a good chance that um, we may have to pull back. I think Montana's disciplined work in shutting down might be undone by states that just never ended. It, that's what I tell public uh, relations releases. I appreciate it if local government um, could uh, provide or museum institutions have through this. Again, we find fall in an all category. We're not a critical service like a grocery store. We don't really well, like sports. There's um, an item I'd like to to Jesse at the Historical Museum has put together a marketing brochure Zula and cultural and she's put it out on template, so each print is met. Would love 
but I'd like like kind of turbo charge that and find some funding to really big printing out there and distribute. So I mean, maybe a Missouri Missoula County fund might source that. I response that an option if we can get that. All done. All right. Thanks, Tate. You're breaking up there just a little bit, but I think I uh, caught most of that. Uh, as far as the templates uh, of the brochure go, if you could uh, distribute anything that you have on that front to me, uh, and I would be happy to uh, push that out to the group here, because one of the one of the conversations Tate and I had had a while back is there uh, a specific project that this group, the roundtable group, might work on collectively, and one possibility would be on the interpretive front. Uh, might might we be able to uh, put our heads together and and collaborate on some sort of a brochure or uh, media that would talk about all of our collective uh, heritage related efforts here in Missoula County? Very good. Did I miss anyone? I think I hit everyone on the line. Is there anyone out there who I missed? Well, I want to be respectful of folks' time, and it, it seems like there is always just a ton of great work going on, and and uh, we are at the end of our uh, hour and a half together, which flew by. Do folks find these meetings useful? Uh, I guess that's that's the baseline question, and we've been trying to do these twice a year, once in the spring or summer and another time in the fall or winter. Uh, are these useful for folks to learn what others are doing in the community and throughout the county? I'm, yes. I'm seeing some thumbs up and heads nodding yes. Yeah, yes. very good. <coughs> so what we might try to do if, if twice a year is working for folks is schedule another one later in the fall. Uh, or early winter uh, between now and then and again because we're out of out of time today uh, I'd like folks for to give some thought to along the lines of is there something that um, that we could or maybe ought to be working on collectively together and I mentioned one possibility to expand upon what Tate's been working on by way of uh, possible brochure that would perhaps uh, uh, collectively inform the public of all of the good work that we're doing in our efforts. Uh, there might be something else though that we're we're not thinking of right now. So maybe give that some thought and and we can always communicate via email between now and our next meeting. Shoot your ideas my way and I'll I'll try to collect them and and make that perhaps maybe the first agenda item for our next meeting. Uh, anything else? Uh, by way of good of the order right now or thoughts that folks want to share? Thank you. Yeah, thanks Thompson and, and we will loop you into the uh, COVID-19 documentation project to make sure that uh, that the culture committee and the tribes are firmly uh, uh, in the midst of those discussions. OK, going once, going twice. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, keep up the good work. Be healthy and look forward to chatting with you uh, between now and the next time we assemble. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. You bet. Goodbye.